Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the School of Visual Arts Masters in Digital Photography program. Polly Arungo is clearly the right person at the right time right now. Multimedia journalist, digital editor, and self-taught photographer, Polly is the founder of Black Women Photographers, a global community and online database of Black women and non-binary photographers. Born in Nairobi, Kenya, Polly has lived around the world from Nairobi to Topeka, Kansas, to Eugene, Oregon, to Washington, DC, to Little Rock, Arkansas, Brooklyn, New York, and currently is in Oklahoma. As a photographer, Polly's work has been published in numerous publications, including Global Citizen, NPR, BBC News, The Loop, Refinery29, The Washington Post, CNN, on and on. Polly is currently uh, teaching classes at the International Center of Photography and is a host in the curator program on Twitter and in 2022 also on LinkedIn. Polly lives and breathes building communities, photography, social media, branding, podcasting, media diversity, African media, and journalism. Please help me to welcome Polly Arungo, whose dedication to supporting voices and talent that must be heard, must be seen, and must be hired is a true inspiration to us all. Thank you, Polly, for being here tonight. Wow, I mean, what a welcome. <laughs> one of the best welcomes I've ever had. And then I'm just like, oh my goodness, no pressure, especially I'm the last in this incredible series. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. Thank you so much to you, Katrina, and your wonderful team for making this possible and to everyone who's listening. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and just dive right in um, to just what I prepared for this evening. Um, as she mentioned that, you know, you can drop a question in the chat or in the q and box at any time. No question is too small, no such thing as a dumb question with this. So feel free to ask a question at any time. Um, so I'm Polly and welcome to my little TED talk that I prepared for y'all tonight. So before I really, you know, dive in some more, I really just wanted to start with this quote from Toni Morrison, who she, you know, was inspired by her father to um, share these words of wisdom. It's a quote that I really read to myself, like, almost every month. Um, I wrote it down, and I just see it, like, daily, really just, again, to remind myself this, and I just figured that we all could use this little reminder. You are not the work you do, you are the person you are. And I shared this because as someone who does a lot of things, I wear a lot of hats. Um, I just always have to constantly remind myself that, you know, I am more than the work I do. Um, my work is not who I am. It is just what I do. And so I really just wanted to share that with you all before we dive in. So with that said, I am a daughter. I am a sister. I am a cousin. I'm a friend. One day I'll be an aunt. Um, and the list things, you know, the list goes on. I'm a woman, I'm a black woman, I'm African, you know, I'm all these things and that really makes up who I am and has obviously played a part into the work I do today. Um, and as mentioned in my introduction, I am from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, my mom is the oldest at 12. And being with that said, I've always, without realizing now, just looking back now, I've always been around, you know, community. I've always been around the mentality that it takes a village. I've always seen, you know, from my mom and from my family, just like what hard work can do, but also just, you know, persistence and resilience and all those amazing things that, you know, embodies my mother and how I try to move and do, you know, today. Um, and with that said, you know, my dad, he's the one who came to the States first, and then we soon followed. Um, <laughs> people always ask me, you know, why Kansas? I have no idea, but I just do know that we did have a host family that was located in Lawrence, Kansas. And so that's why we first, you know, our first stop was in Kansas. So I grew up in Lawrence and then also in Topeka, Kansas, up until the freshman year of my high school. Um, and my childhood was amazing. I mean, I grew up in a very traditional Kenyan home. All I knew how to do and cook was Kenyan food. 
Um, you know, just the communities I was surrounded were primarily African, um, and that's just like how I was raised. And then, you know, after my freshman year of high school, I was told, <laughs> my dad, you know, he sat at his down, I still remember, because it was one of the first turning points, it was the first turning point, I should say, of my life, of just how, you know, everything is a domino effect. And this move that I would have to Oregon really changed the course of my life. Um, and now looking back, obviously it's for the better, everything worked out, I have no complaints, but at that time, you know, just being a freshman in high school, you know, being a high school student, it's like 14, 15, and I was pretty, you know, naive. I mean, all I knew was Kansas. Um, all I wanted to do was go to the University of Kansas. At the time I was playing sports, believe it or not. <laughs> My brother chokes that he, doesn't believe me, but I'm like, you know, I used to ball. I used to be great at basketball. Um, you know, I wasn't going to make it to the WNBA, but I did enjoy, um, you know, basketball. I did enjoy other sports. Um, I was in all these different clubs in Kansas. I felt like I was on top of the world. And then I was told, you know, we're moving to Oregon. Um, and I had no idea what Oregon entailed, you know, to me, it felt like a foreign country, even though it's just on the other side of this country, it just felt like a whole nother world, right? And, you know, first stop we moved was in Portland. So I spent my sophomore year in Portland, Oregon. I did absolutely nothing compared to what I was doing in Kansas. So in Kansas, like I mentioned, I was playing sports. I was super active, really outgoing. Um, you know, I found friends and community and, you know, it, my life was great and it felt it was safe and I was comfortable and that's what I knew. And then I moved to Oregon and I really just was stuck. I, you know, I stopped, you know, just trying out these different clubs. I didn't, even, I think I only joined one and that was, sorry, I only joined one club and that was robotics. <laughs> um, for two seconds, I gave my mom and my dad false hope, thinking I'd be going the computer science route. Uh, and I joined in robotics. I even won a computer science award, the fun fact. And, you know, for me, it was because that's the one place where I actually found a few friends and they also happened to be immigrants. And so that's where I found my tribe when I was in Portland. And then I realized, you know, I still didn't have a passion for this. If I went down that route, obviously that would make my parents very happy, but that's just not what I enjoyed. I was just doing it to pass time and frankly, because I was bored. Um, and then the following year, my mom, she got a job at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon. So I decided I wanted to be close to my mom. So I moved up to Eugene, Oregon. Now this is my third high school. And this is where I finished out my high school years, but then, you know, moving almost every year, that does take a toll. You know, I, in Portland, I just started, I barely scratched the surface of like making friends, finding a community, and then I moved again, starting my, you know, all over and again into this brand new state um, that really felt like a culture shock. And so while I was in Eugene, um, I had a few high school counselors, three in particular, who really just changed everything. They probably don't even realize. I try to tell them, but they're super humble and probably don't even realize the, you know, the role they played in my life. You know, they realized that I was sinking. Um, you know, frankly, I was depressed. And, you know, we just, in my family, you know, mental health and things like that, we didn't really talk about it. And so I really didn't know what it was called then. I just was in a dark place and I just needed to get out of that. And so one of them mentioned yearbooks as a club to join. And I was like, okay, you know, I was like, sure, fine. And so I joined yearbook and that's where I really picked up a camera for the first time. Uh, I believe it was a Canon camera that they were using at the school. And just that feeling of, I don't know how to describe it, but I just felt like Nothing else mattered when I picked up the camera for the first time, when I made my first photograph, when I approached students in my high school to, you know, take their photos for the yearbook. That brought me so much joy and literally it was a complete 180. Um, at the time I was working at McDonald's, a local high school job as cashier, and decided to buy a camera, a laptop, 
And I just started photographing anything and everything that was around me. My brother was my first news. I mean, you name it, I did it. Street, um, nature, outdoors, concerts, fashion, portraits, stuff, like anything and everything. I went out there. You would never see me without my camera. Uh, and at that time, I decided to stay in state and attend the University of Oregon. Um, primarily one because I received a you know a scholarship, but another reason because I only applied to schools uh, in the University of Oregon because my mom made me to made me, and the University of Kansas because at that time I still had hope that it, I would return to Kansas, and I actually didn't get accepted. I did not get accepted. To what I thought would be my dream school, and that was obviously defeating. Um, and I was like, you know what? Okay gonna write it out in Oregon. I guess I'm here for a reason. Don't know what that reason is yet. Uh, and so I stayed in the state and went uh, to Oregon and then where I chose journalism as my degree. Uh, and because the main reason for that again is because I started having this love of photography. And with that, I realized that there's other avenues, you know, things I could study other than doctor, lawyer, engineer where you know, I was expected to pursue. And with that said, you know, again, with my high school counselors, they mentioned, you know, have you ever thought about photojournalism? You no, know, there's a thing called as being a photojournalist. I had no idea. I mean, it sounds silly now, but I really did not have an idea that that was a real viable career path. Um, so this is one of the first photos of me and my camera. My first ever camera, I believe was a Canon 60D. I've since switched to Nikon, um, but you know, it was my first camera um, and I bought it myself again, just the money I earned at, you know, at McDonald's. And so I was thinking about just my journey, preparing, you know, for this talk. And what I've realized is as cliche as it sounds, I think we forget that we've all literally started somewhere, right? These photos, um, I literally screen grabbed them from when I tweeted it out. Apparently it was April 21st on 2015. As you can see, I have literally one like, <laughs> just one like, you know, and I, this is what I, some quote that I saw, you know, when you stop staring at a screen and see the bitty around you, some street photos that I photographed with my phone. Um, I think one of the flowers, I'm pretty sure was in Oregon. This I rem remember was when I was in Santa Monica, California. This was in New York, and again, I think this was in Oregon at some point, but literally, you know, that's what I really just try to do. I just photographed anything around me, but it really just reminded me that we really did start somewhere. Like I was, you know, I've been photographing for some time now and no one wakes up to be, you know, where they're at today, right? I didn't wake up and I, and just all of a sudden just started this organization called Black Women Photographers. My journey started somewhere and sometimes it's so hard to remember that it's so hard to think about how far you've come when you're through the in the thick of things when you are just trying to make it the next day or the next year and this was just a great reminder to me just to see my progress to see that you know i've come so far to see that i've now realized what i enjoy photographing the most which is portraits and fashion um, and some documentary work. But it was, it was just a great reminder to myself that, you know, every single day, you know, you are building to that, whatever that next goal for you is. It really is every single day, um, daily habits that lead you to where you hopefully want to go. And so um, that's why I shared this photo with you all. Um, and here's another example. Uh, this was when I, well, this, I don't know if this was in 2016, but uh, I, it was one again, one of my first early photo shoots uh, at the time of the University of Oregon. A lot of the, you know, extra income that I made was just by photographing my peers. You know, folks who were graduating turned to me, you know, for their senior portraits. I really love this set that was in New York. Um, we were both visiting at the time, and so I photographed her, you know, as she was pursuing her um, extra degree at Columbia. Um, and this was some of my early work. So it's, again, it's just to show you that, you know, we all started somewhere and even myself and here's some of my favorite photos happen to be some of my er earliest photos. 
Um, and I'll keep showing you guys tweets because if you haven't noticed, Twitter is one of my favorite platforms. But uh, this is what I tweeted out in 2017. I will make a difference in this world one day, even if it's just a little bit. And my mom, at the, you know, again, my mom has been one of my earliest uh, cheerleaders. She's my biggest cheerleader. Uh, she said, you already are and very proud of your hard work. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, at one point, my mom will probably like one of your tweets because <laughs> she's on Twitter more than me, believe it or not. But I say that I, I post, I'm sharing this uh, with you all again, because for me and just with the work you do, you always have to figure out what your why is. For me, I've always wanted to make a difference, even when I didn't know what that difference would be. Um, and now, you know, I am making a difference with the organization I started called Black Women Photographers, but whether it was through my photos or my writing or whatever, I mean, I didn't know what, I just knew I wanted to make an impact um, because I was inspired by my mom and her journey, being the oldest of 12, coming to the States, you know, making a way when there was no way, um, and you know what she's doing today at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and with that said, you know, after Oregon, as mentioned in my introduction, I moved to Washington D.C. Um, I was in my senior year, and I received an internship at NPR on the social media desk. And um, being, you know, at NPR, there's several different desks that you can, you know, tag along at. And so one of them was the photo team. Even though I was the social media intern, I really made a note to them that, hey, I'm a photographer, at least I'm an aspiring photographer, I really want to do this. Anytime there's an artist or whoever, anytime there's an opportunity to take photos, please sign me up. And so this was one of the first photos that I took as an intern that got published, and it was of this artist called Goldlink, um, who's based in D.C. Um, and so again, being in DC, that was really life changing. I mean, one of my first assignments as an intern was covering the inauguration of President Trump. Um, my role was to photograph uh, the inauguration weekend, but also via this, you know, the method of Snapchat. <laughs> I don't know who still uses Snapchat anymore, but that was one of my main tools. One of my main like tasks as an intern was to document things on Snapchat, produce you know, shows through Snapchat and Facebook. Um, and so that was one of my first assignment. So I was there for three, four months, loved my time in DC. My internship came to an end. Here I am, I just graduated. Now I'm thinking about like, what's next? Um, and so I was just applying again for different fellowships, internships, anything I could do that could, you know, combine my love for social media, combine my love for photography, um, and then soon also my love for writing at the, you know, after I graduated, I was really at that point doing all those things, just because I realized to be in this field, to be in this industry, oftentimes you have to learn more than one thing, you just have to be this versatile, I don't want to say jack of all trades, but at that point, that was like my goal was to be that. Um, and so once I felt like I mastered photography, even though, trust me, I have not mastered photography, but at that time I felt comfortable enough to start pursuing something else. So I picked up writing and then I picked up social media. And now I'm thinking, okay, I just graduated. I have this great national, you know, internship under my belt. While I was in Oregon, I did several local internships. NPR was my biggest internship yet, um, you know, what's next? And so I received an internship in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, it was a six month internship as a digital intern. Uh, and I'm sharing this because again, you just never know where life will take you. I started in Nairobi, Kenya. Then I went to Kansas. Then I went to Oregon, then DC. And now I'm going from DC to Little Rock, Arkansas. But with anything in life, you know, you just have to make the best out of it. I made the best out of my time at Oregon, you know, and now I'm making my best out of like whatever I can do moving forward. Um, and so as a digital intern, my role really focused on doing social media during the weekdays and then breaking news and reporting on the weekends and the newsletter on the weekends. But again, just like how I was in, at DC at NPR, you know, I told them, hey, by the way, I'm a photographer. You know, I really love taking photos. If there's any time, you know, 
to take photos you know, during my internship, please let me know. And I'm sharing that again because, you know, with anything that you do, you have to make it known what you want, right? People can't guess, people can't, you know, think, you know, assume or whatever. People don't know what you want. You have to make that known. You have to advocate for yourself. You have to let, whether it's a manager or whatever, make your interests known. And that's how people can help you. Uh, because as I tweet often, as I've heard often, closed mouths don't get fed. So make it know what you want, whether by tweeting it out, whether by just letting your manager know, or whoever. Um, so again, at that, my internship, I let it be known that I love photography. I let it be known that I want to do that at any chance I can get. Um, and so one of the ways I made that known was by pitching a series. Um, my series focused on how black owned restaurants got their start in Little Rock. And this was one of the assignments that I went out. So not only was I able to you know, do the photos for the story, I was able to do the interview and I was able to write up the story. So I did all the hats um, while, as, you know, while as an intern. And so it's one of the things I'm still proud of because again, I'm combining all my loves while also amplifying, you know, uh, you know, minority communities, um, you know, helping, you know, with a small platform that I had, helping amplify them and hopefully get some business their way. Uh, so if you go to Arkansas Democrat Gazette, you can check out my bylines and see some of my clips. Um, but this is one of them that I, you know, one of the stories that I really loved. So after Arkansas, <laughs> I tell you, my life story is so crazy and it's still unfolding, but um, after Arkansas, I went to New York. Uh, while I was wrapping up my fellow, my internship, one of my friends that I met just virtually, um, but also at, you know, one of the conferences I went to called NEBJ, which is the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, I met my friend there and she just like randomly reached out to me pretty sure she dm'd me on twitter and was like polly what are you up to these days uh she remembered me for my work what i was doing at dc at npr and i was like well i just wrapped up this internship it's about to end I have no idea what i'm doing next you know of anybody hiring let me know because i'm hoping to you know get a full-time job and not just internship after internship um, and she introduced me to my then boss um, at New York Public Radio. Um, you know, I got that introduction because sometimes that's, you know, unfortunately, sometimes having those introductions can make all the difference. You know, people sometimes, oftentimes hire who they know and who they, you know, a strong recommendation goes a long way. Um, I applied for the role as a digital editor role at The Takeaway, which is a show by you know New York Public Radio, and did all the interview rounds, and I got the job. So I went from Little Rock to New York in a matter of a few weeks uh, in June of 2018, and I was like, oh my goodness, this also felt like a culture shock because going from Little Rock to you know Brooklyn, New York was such a change, but for all the right reasons. Um, and during my time there, you know, my main role again was social, was editorial focused. Um, but I did my freelance photography whenever I could. Uh, some of my favorite assignments came, you know, just meeting editors and meeting people just randomly. Um, this was a photo I, I took, I believe it was at Afropunk Festival. Um, I love documenting just black joy, just like, you know, joy, period, but fashion, portraits, those are the kind of stuff I love to do. So I did a lot of freelance work at my time, you know, in New York. Um, and so here's an image, one of my favorite images to date. And, um, you know, being in New York and making these photos while also working full time, I, I, I started feeling like, yeah, I mean, I was doing things that I could never imagine, you know, photographing an assignment for New York Fashion Week for Refinery 29. Never in my wildest dreams would I thought I'd be doing that. But I still felt stuck. I still felt like, you know, there was a lot of gaps in this industry, um, a lot of ways that I just felt like still felt invisible, still felt like, you know, just the resources weren't there. I was still searching, you know, for a photo-related community. 
I found a tribe at, you know, for journalists for within NABJ, but I was still finding a community of, you know, other Black women photographers, you know, who had similar interests, similar goals. And I was, you know, I, I just couldn't find it even being in New York. And especially at my time, you know, in Oregon when I first started my photo journey. Um, so while I was in New York, it was around June when there was a lot of conversations at that time related to Black Lives Matter and the social uprisings. When prior to that, I was like hearing again, a lot of just comments from editors being in news, hearing from just like photo editors saying that, you know, they couldn't hire Black photographers because they couldn't find them. And I was just like flabbergasting because I'm like, here I am, you know? And then I knew obviously other photographers you know, who are doing great work um, and having these conversations play out on social media, I just felt like I was still on the sidelines and I was tired of feeling just that waiting and, you know, you can wait and you can wait for a very long time. Um, but I was just tired of waiting and I felt like I had to do something, although at the time I don't know what, um, but one thing I didn't mention was while I was at the university, Oregon, you know, when I started my journey, I actually made this Twitter list that's still active um, called Black Women Photographers, not knowing one day I'll launch an organization. But again, when I first started, I was just trying to find other photographers and then other photographers who looked like me, who was, you know, going through the same things I was going through, who had all the million questions and that needed a safe space to ask them and just trying to learn because I didn't go to school for photography so just trying to navigate this industry um as you all know it's really hard you know to do hey um and so you know here in new york still feeling all these i was feeling back in oregon and was just tired of waiting and so i started reaching out to people from my twitter list um one by one really anyone who had their dms open i reached out and i just started asking them questions you know like how are you feeling, you know, as a photographer in this industry for X, you know, however long you've been photographing? Um, do you feel that you have a community? Do you feel that you have a place to turn to for advice, for resources, for mentors? Have you been getting work and pay to work? You know, the pandemic obviously made things a lot worse, but prior to the pandemic, a lot of these photographers that I reached out to, they were still having trouble getting work and, you know, great pay at that. Um, and so with that said, that really gave me the push I needed to just, again, take that leap to like try and do something about it, not knowing that it spiral into all these things that I've been doing now. But um, I, you know, I started, you know, by just one, addressing the fact that a lot of people were hurting financially with this pandemic. And so I made a COVID-19 relief really fund, um, just crowdsourcing on Twitter anyone and everyone who would be willing. I tweeted at them. I, I mean, I tweeted every single day for like, I think two, three weeks straight. And I was able to raise over 14,000 um, to help, you know, again, Black women photographers who need immediate financial relief. Um, that was able to help 70 photographers from around the world uh, who just, again, needed that immediate impact because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was in June, 2020. And then in July is when I officially launched the community and the directory with now that has over a thousand photographers from 40 plus different countries. Um, and, you know, since launching, I mean, it's just taken a life of its own, but I think that's just a testament to, again, the need that this, one, the industry needed this, but also two, we as black women photographers, we really needed it for ourselves as well. Um, and so here are two screenshots. Um, you know, I was fortunate to have literally a, a month after, so I launched in July 2020. In August, uh, NASDAQ reached out and um, actually I, I also reached out to NASDAQ, I, I should say that. I reached out to them first and then we had all these conversations about, um, obviously it worked out. They spotlighted me as part of their Amplifying Black Voices campaign. And I was able to amplify Black women photographers on a national you know, platform. That was my first major feature, one of my first major features for the work I was doing literally just a month later. And I was able to have my work showcased in Times Square. 
After that NASDAQ spotlight, BBC News Africa learned about the work I was doing and they brought me to New York again uh, to see my work one more time in Times Square, but also to interview me and my story through the lens of a Kenyan you know, woman photographer. Uh, and so that, would, again, these are two incredible things that never thought would happen by just amplifying others, by just, you know, doing this selfless act of just trying to pour into this community to, one, try to establish a community, and then, again, bring these access to resources and opportunities and whatnot to a community. Um, and here's one of the first tweets I made about Black women photographers. Um, these are one of the first few, I want to say it was like a little over 100 photographers were part of the first initial phase of the directory. Um, and, you know, with the community, there's so many different things right now. There's the portfolio reviews, there's the workshops, there's the grants, um, there's the events, and then just the community itself. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to share with you all is not just, you know, how I feel like it's made a difference, but how it's made a difference in some of the members. And so I'll be sharing a few quotes from them. This is from Lauren Washington. She's a, a portrait photographer and filmmaker based in DC. She says, photography is so heavily white and male that it can definitely be isolating if you don't have someone to turn to. When I found BWP, it felt like a breath of fresh air to not only see how many Black women photographers there were, but how many there are globally. Um, and that right there, I'll just stop there, is one of the things that excites me the most because being someone who grew up in the Midwest, you know, when people think about photo, when the people think about the arts, they obviously think about New York or LA or whatever, but we're not just located in those parts, right? I have folks in the rural areas. I have someone in Montgomery, Alabama. I have someone in Brussels, Belgium. I have someone in Vienna. Like I have photographers in this directory literally all over. And that's what truly excites me because when I reach out to editors and I reach out to brands and I reach out to organizations and I, you know, I'm telling them about this community and this resource that I've started, you know, I'm telling them, hey, you can actually hire locally, right? You don't have to fly someone in and parachute a photographer in. I can help you find somebody locally. And if I don't have them in my directory, I will, you know, send you to another directory or database. I'll find someone locally that you can hire. Because um, that's one of my main points with this work that I started is really just hiring us. Um, outside of, you know, the spotlighting, outside of just the exposure or whatever, at the end of the day, like all of us, <laughs> everybody here listening, we have bills to pay, we want to get hired, we want to be able to, you know, afford more than just paying bills, um, and we want to, you know, hopefully make a career out of our art, and that's really the goal, and so that's what, you know, Lauren said, anywhere I go now, I can find my tribe of Black women photographers, and I can find support 24-7. Inari in Atlanta. So as I mentioned briefly, um, one of the things within this community is the grants. Uh, to celebrate the first anniversary, I partnered with Nikon to establish a grant fund of 40K in funding and 10K plus in gear. And Inari was one of the first camera giveaway winners. Uh, and <laughs> we surprised her on Zoom. I told her she would be having a portfolio review, ended up being us on the committee, uh, surprising her. And we all broke down in tears. Uh, this was her first time upgrading after five years. Um, and so being able to, again, you know, Inari does incredible work. If you look her up, uh, Inari Brianna on Instagram, her work is amazing. Uh, and this was her first time really having a major upgrade. She couldn't afford to you know, do it. So one of the barriers in this industry it's just the entry point. I mean, when I first bought my camera, it was a little over 1200. Um, and that was just like years ago. Imagine now, imagine all the lenses. I mean, it's just expensive to even just get started. Um, and so being able to provide gear is something again, <laughs> never that I'd be able to do by doing this community, but I'm just grateful that I'm able to, you know, make things like this happen. Here's some of the work from the community. If you go to blackwomenphotographers.com, I on the homepage, I rotate this monthly. So here are the folks who are being spotlighted in December. 
Rita, she's incredible. I mean, everyone's incredible, so I'll keep repeating that. Uh, she does documentary and photojournalism work based out of Atlanta. Jada Imani M, Ariel Gray in Montgomery, uh, Nehemi in Paris, Hilaire in Fort Worth, Texas, Dorothy in Montreal, Canada, and so on. Um, here's another testimonial from Tess Surrett. She's based in Lagos, Nigeria. She was one of the first to be you know, part of the community. And she said, I found a family within this community of great women who I look up to and now call my friends. The constant sharing of jobs and grants, classes, portfolio reviews, gave me the confidence to believe in my work, to connect with top photo editors and apply for opportunities which landed me work. Through this community, I found belief in myself and my art. Um, and one thing I love about, you know, doing this work is really giving someone, you know, confidence again to believe in themselves is truly priceless. Um, we've all, well, maybe I shouldn't say all, but I personally, you know, have faced, sometimes still face imposter syndrome. Um, and all you really need is just that one person to believe in you, uh, one person in your corner to cheer for you. For the first person to, for that me was my mom. Now, fortunately, I have so many cheerleaders in my corner advocating for me, you know, speaking my name in rooms that I'm not in. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. And so being able to help do that for others, it, again, it's something I never expected to do with this work, um, but it really is just an, a priceless feeling. Uh, Aisha, she's based uh, in London. Pre previously, she was in South Africa. Uh, she mentioned so all the different opportunities uh, that she's had within BWP. Um, some of them uh, are, you know, receiving software as part of some of the, you know, partnerships we had in the past, and also attending workshops on managing finances and pitching. Uh, for me, you know, I didn't go to a school for photography, but one thing I learned is really the business side of photography is some of the most important things you have ever know, um, you'll have to learn. And if you don't learn it early on, you'll learn it the hard way. And so what I try to do with the organization is to provide these free opportunities to learn the business side from what's in your contract to what's in li what's licensing like, to setting rates, to negotiating, to pitching yourself to editors. Those are some of the many conversations I've been hosting this past year and a half for the community. Uh, and here's one from Mika. She's based in Oakland, and she mentioned how American Airlines and Firefox hired her through the directory. Um, and so really, when I think about, again, doing this work, I can't do this alone. As I mentioned earlier, I was raised in a home that was like the mentality of it takes a village, it takes a community. Um, you know, I'm building community day by day, but again, I cannot do it alone. And so any of you who are listening, how you can support my work with BWP and just my work in general is to really just spread the word. Word of mouth is something, again, it's priceless, priceless tool. Um, you know, just tweeting out the link. If you see someone who's talking about they need a photographer saying, hey, have you heard about BWP? Do you know that there's this organization of Black women photographers that you can look at um, and, you know, hopefully hire from? Um, you can retweet, reshare, whatever platform you're on, the work that I've been posting, other photographers, um, you can let other students, other prof professors, whoever, and anyone willing to listen, you know, you can just spread the word as the easiest free, you know, way to support the work I've been doing. Uh, and with that said, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for listening. Um, you know, that's really just a quick glimpse of who I am, the work that I've been doing, and what I've been up to this past year and a half. Uh, I still work full time. Um, and I still do BWP, which feels like a full time job in itself. Um, but I'm always willing to, you know, help out whenever I can. So feel free to connect with me on social. Um, I'm on all the major platforms. It's just at my first and last name dot com or whatever. So at polyrungu and my website is polyrungu.com. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Polly. It's like, I took a lot of notes and I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Um, first of all, my first job was at McDonald's also. Oh, you see? 
Yeah. All great people start at McDonald's. <laughs> oh yeah. I will never forget those training videos. Oh yes. <laughs> and so boy, so many questions, but you you at the very end you mentioned you're also working full time. I mean, they're so important for you to like take care of yourself also. I mean, I thought BWP was your job. I'm like, oh no, she has another <laughs> job. Yeah. I mean, how do you, you know, make time? You, nowadays people use the term self-care, but you know, right. So you don't burn out. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, that's a great question. Um, as something that I still actively try to do and take my own advice. Um, the first time I experienced burnout was actually when I was in school uh, at U of O. Um, I was doing several internships. I was working, um, I was freelancing, and I was just exhausted. I literally could not do a single thing. I had to go see my advisor and I had to, you know, delay some of my work. I had to like pause, whatever it's called. And I took a semester off. I was just exhausted. That was the first time that I really heard new. I mean, I've heard the term, but I never knew until I actually experienced it. Um, and ever, ever since then, I'm like, I start to recognize the signs now. So whenever I'm feeling like overwhelmed, whenever I'm feeling literally your body, at least my body will let me know when I'm feeling, you know, too tired and when I'm starting to feel burnout, um, that's when I start reducing items off my plate. So whether it's like delegating, whether it's like outsourcing, whatever was coming, you know, at the earlier on, whatever I could do to just like, you know, work smarter, not harder with my freelance work and just like, with just all aspects of my work. That's what I try to do. Um, now I'm in a much better place where I'm able to just, again, realize, okay, maybe I have too many commitments. I have to say no. And, you know, saying no is one of the most powerful things you can do as a creative, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, whatever. When you learn how to say no, I mean, that's when life gets better for you. And so for me, I just started saying no more often. I actually said it and not feel ba bad about it. Um, not having that, you know, fear of, oh, if I say no, I won't get this opportunity ever again. Like now I've like, I'm no, not, no longer in that place. So I say no often, I use no as a full sentence and ever since it's been great. Um, and then I also just try to find ways, especially when I was working in news, try to find ways to like, just not think about the day and day. You know, try not to bring your work at home. It's easier said than done, especially now that most of us are working at home, you know, trying to create that separation. But now I'm, my phone is often on do not disturb, especially when I'm like offline. Um, you know, when I first started BWP and when photographers would reach out to me, literally in so many different time zones, I felt the need to respond and be on all the time. And like, Oh no, someone just emailed me at 2 a.m. I have to email them back. And, and I'm like, that was crazy. Like, <laughs> that was just literally crazy. Like, I was burning like both ends of the, you know, candlestick. And I realized I don't need to do that. I need to set boundaries. I need to create that separation. I need to take my mind off of work and then also take my mind off of BWP, which is also work, uh, and just do the things I enjoy. So in the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things me and my mom did that we really should get back to is we just took walks. And I'd made a habit of not bringing my phone on the walk unless I wanted to take photos, but not having my phone on me, just leaving it at home. That way I can just like be out there and, again, not think about work. Um, Again, just like starting to utilize my streaming services. Like I would just do whatever, Netflix, you know, binge a bunch of things on the weekends, catch up on sleep. Like all of those ways are the ways that I try to like take that self care. Um, because one thing about building community or doing community building, you really have to have that support. And as you mentioned, you really have to take care of yourself. I can't do this work if I'm not okay. I can't do this from an empty cup. I have to pour back into my own cup. I have to have people pour back into me. And so honestly, self-care for me can be as little as watching a mute movie on HBO or to just having my phone on Do Not Disturb. So those are some of the ways that I try to have that balance. Okay, I'll, I'll try that. Leave the phone at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's good. It makes so much sense. I think that's really great. Um, so uh, Tom asked this great question. It, he, you know, he really appreciates how you, how important building community is to you. And of course, you've now 
reviewed I mean, numerous portfolio reviews, you know the women from all around the world, you've seen their work, you've seen their mm -hmm. work uh, change. And he yeah. would like to know how those other photographers have influenced your own photographic practice. Oh, such a great question. I think, I think one of the ways is I see a lot of them just having fun. And I know that sounds like, you know, so ridiculous, but I think sometimes, especially with social media, you can have this idea that if you see all this kind of similar work being put out, or you see this is the kind of work that's getting published, that you have to create that type of work too, and that kind of aesthetic. Um, but what I realized within, you know, especially by doing these some of these in-person meetups that we've been doing, we've been doing a few photo walks um, and studio meetups, is that we could have, you know, at these meetups, we'd have the same three photograph, the same like three models, um, the same lighting setup, but every person in that meetup will have a different outcome, will have a different style, will have a different way of editing and they, and different use of like shadows or lights or whatever. And they would look entirely different, right? I'm like, we were all in the same room, but every image looks different and you would not believe that. And what I'm saying is like, all of them just still have fun. They still are navigating you know, what style they like. They're still, some of them are still finding their style, you know, finding their voice. Um, and they're not afraid to just like try something new. And I think sometimes we get so, you know, stuck on, you know, the status quo and feeling like this is the right way to do it, but there really isn't, right? There's, you know, the technical things like rule of thirds or whatever, but you really just have to have fun. You really have to just see what sticks, what makes sense for you. Um, and think outside of the box. And that's what I've been, you know, appreciating with the photographers in this community is like, I never thought about, you know, doing this kind of angle, or I never thought about, you know, switching it up like this. So there's ways that I'm learning from them as much as I'm helping them learn. Like they have influenced me so much, um, especially with my photography practice. But sadly, I will admit that, you know, doing this work, I haven't had much time to actually go out and make photos as much as I used to. Um, but I have really like, again, I've just been making mental notes. I'm like, wow, like, you know, this, like, you know, using a fisheye or whatever, like they're really just having fun with it. And so when I do go back out, it's like, that's what I'll just try and incorporate is just having fun and just like forgetting everything that I learned and just like, okay, just go out. Don't overthink. Don't get in your head. Just go out and create, you know, getting back to the basics. Absolutely. I mean, we know how destructive it is. Like, I need to chase algorithms. And likes. <laughs> right, it's right, like, exactly. Oh no, please, that's deadly. Um, <laughs> speaking of social media, <laughs> um, we've all heard, like, you know, everybody can see your social media feed. I love how you use the Twitter the screen captures. <laughs> um, and um, of course, I'm not speaking about myself, but people have been known to say things on social media that they regret. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard to sort of do you have or should you have like a professional profile you know i mean how can you be like honest on social media and still be professional <laughs> <laughs> no um good question um and you know i think i think part of it for me is like the way i just approach social media um especially just like again with my environment like being in a traditional opinion at home <laughs> If I, I wouldn't say anything that I would be embarrassed my mom reading. Like if I knew my mom wouldn't be happy, I probably would have tweeted out because I know that eventually she would see that post on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever. So that's just, I've, I've always approached it. Um, but I've, you know, I've thought about like, okay, do I need to have a, a personal page or whatever? And to be quite honest, I can't manage multiple pages like I would just be overwhelmed. I mean, I have made a separate page from my photography and there's probably only like a hundred posts. Like I, you know, I never, I was never consistent with it. Um, and for me, it's just like, as long as you just, I know, again, we've heard this all the time, but truly, as long as you just stay at that authentic, um, you know, one minute I may be posting about some show that I really enjoy. The other minute, yeah, I'll be sharing something BWP related. But all of it is just like, I've never, have never, will never change who I am, change, you know, what you see on social media. It's what you get in real life. Like my persona has not changed. 
you know, this is just who I am. This is what I enjoy. This is what I'm passionate about. These are things I care about. This is the kind of work I do. And that's all, and all of that is what you'll see online as well. Um, so I think as long as you have this healthy mix, you know, you can share your interests. You can also share the work and you can also be a professional, but you can also have fun with it and show your personality. You don't have to hide that. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people forget is that they feel like you have to be like this rigid person in the box. And I'm like, no, show your personality, especially if we're in the creative field. Like that's how people, sometimes people will hire you just based off of that, right? Not necessarily just off your talent of your work alone. Sometimes it's about who you are as a person. If people like you as a person, if they, you know, want to, if they can see themselves like on a full day of set with you, sometimes you only get that job other than somebody else who probably takes better photos than you, but you just seem like a great person. I've had people tell me that all a lot. It's like, you know, you're just a great person and, and you know, we are just happy to support you first and foremost, and then, you know, BWP. And so uh, with that said, it's just, again, don't be afraid, you know, to show this different process of you. If you have to pause and think about it, chances are maybe you shouldn't post about it, right? Maybe you should just leave it for a group chat with friends or sleep on it. You know, I think a part of the, the problem with social media, um, there's this sense that of like urgency that people feel like, especially with Twitter, you know, they see like, oh, it's happening in real time. I have to weigh in or it's trending. I have to give my hot take. And one of the things I realized is that not everything, you know, needs your comment. Not everything needs a response. I don't engage, you know, with trolls. I don't jump into every hot topic. Um, nine times out of 10 is something that's trending. I probably wouldn't even post about it. That doesn't mean I don't care about what's happening in this world. I obviously do, but I don't need to post about it for others to know that I care. I care. I could do things offline. I could talk about it with family at home. Like, you know, that's how, you know, you can show those you know, you can get it out of your system in that regards. But, you know, with social media, it, like you mentioned, like people can pull things up. <laughs> I pull my, my own old tweets all the time just to, again, to show my progress, to show people that I started somewhere. I didn't wake up and just do this overnight. You know, this has, has been years in the making. But yeah, I mean, that's, I think for me, it's just, again, you know, I don't have to engage. You don't have to engage. Don't get, you know, caught up within the, like the system of likes and, you know, things like that. Going viral for me is, it's not worth it. Um, and I, I saw somebody tweet this out. I was like, there's always like that one person on Twitter. You never want to be that one person that's trending. I'm like, after realizing that, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be that one person <laughs> that's trending. I just want to do great work. I just want to have fun. I just want to, you know, help people along the way. And that for me is just, all that I show on on social media so I hope that helps oh, I think I'm gonna I like the idea of it, like internalizing the mom filter and <laughs> yes. and we've all done it we've written the email and then yes. just not send it just don't <laughs> send it but writing it was exactly. really important oh yeah. but I think that I think that's really great advice uh, we have a great question here from I apologize the name from a uh, Julie Nara from a women's street photographer Yes, and, my friend. Oh, okay. Well, here we are more community. Um, yes. she, she said it was great to learn about your background and your journey to P BWP. And she wants to know, have you seen things improve for Black women photographers since starting BWP? Yes, great work. And first, if you all um, who are listening and you don't know what Women's Street Photographers is, please do check it out. It's a great community. She's also built a community of photographers, women photographers in street, something that you don't often see. Um, over 100,000 followers on Instagram. So do go check that um, and follow her platform. Um, but no, you know, I know I officially launched, you know, just a year and some change ago, but I've already seen such an impact by, again, just seeing the photographers that, 
you know, have some who told me that they were going to give up. Some of them who told me that they were going to quit photography altogether before learning and joining BWP. Um, and just seeing, you know, some of the opportunities they've received that, you know, maybe one day they would have received it on their own. But having this platform, having, you know, again, that one person rooting for you, advocating for you can make all the difference. And for me, you know, and for them, I am that one person. And so um, I have seen so many folks get hired, um, you know, by Red Bull, by Nike, by, you know, photo editors from New York Times, The Guardian, NPR, Washington Post, a lot of them getting their first published assignments within BWP. A lot of them, you know, learning, earning higher, you know, rates because they learned how to negotiate, that they learned that, you know, this, you know, maybe is too low of a pay. This brand has the money. Um, and also learning that they can make passive income like licensing um, or speaking or whatever. And so there's different impacts like that. I've seen like that. And then it's again, also just like, just the community aspect of just seeing these photographers, you know, uplift each other and that they're actually really genuine about it. That one of the things, you know, I've tried to, you know, foster is just like this community feeling. It's not a competition. You know, we were, when we all started, we felt like we had to do it solo because, you know, photos is a solo job. It's really independent. It's isolated work, but realizing that, yes, <laughs> there is enough work for all of us. Yes, that, you know, you can support somebody else and that's not going to take away from you at all. Um, that's, you know, some of the work that I'm most proud of and the impact that I've been seeing is just like everybody cheering for each other and wanting to see each other win and passing along work. You know, we have a Slack channel that has about 800 of us in the Slack and there's a jobs and grants channel. And it's just amazing to see other people post grant opportunities and job opportunities with their fellow photographers, for their fellow photographers to take advantage of. Because again, it doesn't take anything away from you by sharing, by amplifying, you know, your light will get dimmed. And so seeing that happen uh, in such a short amount of time, seeing just like the different, you know, platforms that also been inspired by my work and some have, you know, started their own initiatives based off of my work as well. Um, you know, that is something I couldn't have asked for. And so it's been great to see that happen over time. Yep, I think that idea of, you mentioned because knowing your value and, exactly. and stating it clearly. I'll be honest. Yes. I have worked with some um, members of Black Women Photographers and they're like, yes, you have. Oh yeah, can you pay? And I'm like, yeah, we can do that. And it's like, you can always ask. I mean, within yeah. reason, within reason. So no, showed, exactly. like you showed Hillary's work. So I've been working with her. So that's, yes. that's all good. Absolutely. So I think it's really great in the communities for everybody listening. It could be your fellow classmates, you know, people that, that you meet on set. It could start small, people that you can be honest with, they could support mm -hmm. you. Um, because you you do need a sounding board. And I think that's really, really important. And I think that's what people have at school. Um, what you've created, Women's Street Photographers, you know, it is it is great. And there is enough to go around, mm -hmm. you know, and more. the more you share, as we know, the, the more it comes back. So I think that that's so important. You have, this has been such an inspiring, I feel like it's the holidays, <laughs> such, a, <laughs> such an inspiring talk. Yes. Like, you know, I, I, I shouldn't say this is kid from Nairobi. <laughs> and then look and look what you've done i'm not calling you a kid you understand no 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 but yeah. it's funny that you say that because i i tell it to my mom all the time like mom you know one like literally and she also tells this to us like one at one point in her life she was fetching water now we have a fireplace in our home like you know it's just like the little things like that that we can often take for granted and realizing that you know you know my grandmother she doesn't know english you know, my mom was the first to go to school and she's made sure that her siblings went to school. And obviously education for us was so crucial and important. Um, and, you know, it, we have come a long way and it's just mind blowing still, even now, I still get overwhelmed thinking about it. 
just like how, you know, far, <laughs> you know, just how far, you know, how things have come. And, you know, we really started from nothing. And here we are, here I am doing work that I never dreamed of that is happening. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, now I have to dream bigger. So <laughs> it really is, you know, really inspiring. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So on that note for dreaming bigger and letting people know what you want to do, I think I really appreciate your time, your talk. I mean, it Thank really, you. in a way, sort of everybody, your New Year's resolutions, it was literally Polly's talk. <laughs> and we look forward to a, a happy, healthy, and creative 2022 for everybody. Yes. And Polly, I'm, I'm thrilled to know you and look really forward to where you and the community goes. And I think it's going to be a very, very good year. So thank, thank you. you so much for helping us wrap this uh, 10th anniversary of the SVA Master in Digital Photography I3 lecture series. Thank you so much for having me, truly an honor.